Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast here with Benji as always for the Sunday of the European Continental Championships when it finishes actually with the men's road race, 180 kilometer course around Trento in the Sud Tyrol. It actually has the hardest, well, longest climbs in the first third of the race. And then they go into a circuit doing a, the Povo climb. They do about eight times the climb. We saw it in the women's race yesterday. It's three and a half Ks at 5%, but it's steeper at the end, but no outrageous pinches. No part where you're like, that's where Alaphilippe could launch it, like you have on, say, Murder Britannia or the Cote de Fossil Lou in stage one of the Tour de France. So start list pretty stacked, actually, given that we've got everyone that is from a European nation. Um, obviously, no Michael Matthews here who would have won if Australia was allowed to participate. But we do have Remco. We've got a strong Belgian team. No Wout van Aert, who's their leader in the World Championships. But they've got other characters who'd be in that race. Campanarts, Dylan Turns. As well, France got Bardet, Thibaut Pino, Pikachu's back in action. No one, Valverde for Spain? Yes, sir. One country that's actually missing is uh, Denmark, who was not at the start line here, which is... And Britain. Kind of surprising, together with Great Britain. So I don't really know how, how this works, uh, how certain teams are not here and certain teams are here. But in the end, if they're not here, that's their problem and not ours. So <laughs> Is it a Brexit thing? Seriously, uh, I know. Denmark's probably not a Brexit thing. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> they drew a line at Hamburg and said no mask, but I guess Norway, Norway are here, so yeah, that rules out that theory. But yeah, there's some really, really solid riders here. We've got Hirschi uh, as well, Groschartner, who just finished the Vuelta Espana, Marcus Hulgarth in Norway, has just signed a two year deal at Trek Segafredo. But the favourites probably were the Italians with Colbrelli in obscene form, supported by Ulisi, Trenton, and Moscow and Ghana. Catania, Bagioli, Gariotti, just outrageously strong team. And uh, I guess the three guys that we would expect to be good on this course are the obvious, Vlad van Aert, MVDP, and uh, Alaphilippe are not here. But before we get into Benji discussing the outrageous start to this race, mention our show partner, LaCole, who produced Performance Cycling Apparel. They've supported us. We passed our one-year anniversary already, uh, both the podcast and LaCole's support. And if you want to check out their performance cycling apparel, which is actually produced relatively close to here at the base of Monte Grappa uh, in Italy, then you can see at the link below, www.lacol.cc. Benji, early action in this race, which you were keenly attuned to. Yes, yes, yes. I was watching this race and I was like, should I watch from the start? I should probably start watching from uh, from the start. And uh, I didn't know at that point that this would become one of the best races of 2021, in my opinion. And we started off with... Um, the earlier hills, the ones that you see at the start of the park, or the ones that are not part of the uh, circuit section. And we had a breakaway of four opening up. Van Hooke for Belgium, two riders from France, which was Jean Poussin and also Bonamour. And all, no, it was Parepentre and Bonamour, my bad. And as fourth rider, we had a, uh, a Spanish rider, Soto. So all in all, not the strongest of breakaways, but Parepantra and Bonamour have been in a lot of decent breakaways before Van Hook as well. I think he was the rider that crashed out in the Montalcino breakaway that Mauro Schmidt ended up winning in the Giro this year. And overall, his group was at the front for not that much time. I think like 20 seconds, 30 seconds, 40 seconds. And we saw Trenton moving back in the group because he was going to the car. Again, no race radio, so... That's what they have to do. Trenton, surprising that he does that in that team of Italians, because I would expect him to be one of the later ones in this race personally. And he went to the car and just a second later, he goes to the front. Then we've got Italy pacing with one or two riders at the front to try and keep this gap relatively close because they know there's a Belgian up front. No Belgians going to take over in the peloton. Not like a, of an Avamad at the Olympics riding from the start, for example. But uh, that group eventually got caught again because there was action in the group behind once again, attacks left and right. And also that Italy pace closing it down quite a bit. Another group goes while the other one has been caught, including a Belgian against on the Wolf. Argil as well, Adria for uh, Spain. That's a very talented rider. Keep that name in your head, Roger Adria. We've got Jonas Rapp and uh, that's a German and Oliveira in there as well for Portugal. And once again, Italy pacing behind. Filippo Ganna pacing. And if Ganna's pacing, you know that the tempo is pretty high. And you know that people in the breakaway are not likely to survive too much longer. And then we started the uh, the biggest climb of this race, arguably, certainly. 
and that is the Kandriai climb. That was the 7.1%, 5.6 kilometer climb, the third one in the race. And we saw a move by an Emko Evenepoel in the peloton while all these groups were already caught at a certain point. I think he was following an attack, but I don't know who the attacker was. And we had just attacks all over for a second there for like one to two kilometers before we dove into the descent head on with basically a group of 38 left after that descent. Then, in all honesty, we keep talking about Remco being shit at descending and so forth at certain points, but he was second this entire descent basically in that group, and he was not really doing that bad of a descent, and the peloton was breaking up left and right, and the second that that 38-man group came together just after the descent, we realized that the people behind were on decent gaps, and Kampenaz was in that group and was like, I'm going to set pace here for a bit, I'm going to counter attacks for... Remco Evenepoel and Campenarts was very strong from that point onwards, but it's kind of insane. With 100 kilometers to go, 38 people are left in contention of this race, and the rest is already in groups that are destined to go down. Isn't that, like, crazy? <laughs> yeah, and I guess Sam Bennett's made to trip out. It's his first race for a long time, and I think he got dropped on like, one of the first climbs. Yeah. So I don't know what really the point of that was, uh, but... Anyway, he's back racing uh, as well as like Sagan was in trouble. So like I've got guys who I thought, you know, because there was a bit of hubbub, oh, Italy didn't pick Nizzolo. Well, the way this was raced, riders like Nizzolo never had a chance um, because they made the most of these early climbs yep. uh, before even. And then the, the last climb, which, you know, I've read it out, oh, 3K is 5%. That's not the hardest climb in the world. But the way they raced it and attacked on it, they made it a lot harder for some of the bigger guys. But yeah, that group of 38 Benji, every time they hit a climb was being stretched and attacked again and again. Yep. And those attacks kept on coming in that group. With 77k to go, Campanar just kept on attacking and countering attacks as well, mainly countering actually, and pacing for Remco in that group. And then we had another Polvo Ascension at 75k to go. And they go on to that climb and it seems like Bardet is attacking while Campanar is just setting tempo with Remco in second wheel. And I just wasn't sure what Belgium was planning there. Were they just going to keep on riding with Campenarts up front uh, at the front of that 38-man group, just riding ahead of Evenepoel? Or was Evenepoel about to go for an attack somewhere? But I think it was just that Campenarts was so, so strong today. We talk about the Olympics and we think about the domestique work of Trotnik. Today, that was certainly Campenarts in the initial portion of the race. Such a strong rider this man has become. Just from changing from a time trial is to everything else except for like top level climber <laughs> it's kind of insane i can't wait to see what he does on a parkour like roubaix and so forth but the real action happened just after that Volvo ascension once we go down most of the attacks kept on coming on the flat section between the uh climbs on the circuit and we noticed the move by Podden, hulgard trentin pogacar and Kampenarts was the one to close that down for belgium and follow that attack and that group actually got a bit of a lead because Evenepoel was like, okay, there's a Belgian up front. I'm not going to do the work. Mohoric was like, but we've got a guy up there as well. Trenton's up there. So Italians were like, hey, not my job to do this. And we saw Franz that moved up and was setting up to do major tempo from that point onwards. And on to the next Polvo climb, something was happening because Pino started his pull. Uh, a very strong pull, not a long one, but a very strong pull. And then he went to the side of the road and just went to his goats in uh in France again, while we saw Bargill take over, hammered it completely. And from that point onwards, everything was prepping for a move and Cosnefro was the one that was doing it. And you, you need to keep in mind, we still have that group like 30 seconds, 20 seconds ahead, the Padun, Hulgard, Pogacar group. And we see a move by Cosnefro in the peloton. The second that in the breakaway, we also see a move by... Um, by Pogacar doing exactly the same. So we've got two groups attacking at the same time. But the, the attack of Cosnefry and Evenepoel following that was, was just too fast. And, and they basically dropped almost the entire peloton, except for here she was just behind. And then Italy just behind that with Colbrelli as well, trying to get back to that move by Cosnefry because that acceleration was very large. And they all come together at the front. And we've got a group of uh, the following riders, Hulgard, Evenepoel, Colbrelli, Trentin, Pogacar, here she, Cosnefry, Kampenarts, Sivakov, and Odin. Odin actually imploding during this attack, but Hermans was also coming back. And uh, when you see that group, what do you think about it? I think 
I always go back to Remco as he's such a unique rider and he's obviously the favorite for Belgium who they're riding for. And he's unique in the sense that he really can't sprint. Like he has so many strong attributes that he really like when you think of a guy like Pagacha, he actually, you know, he can actually sprint. If he gets everything right, if someone even like Corbrelli or Trentin makes a big mistake or leads him out and Pagacha's on one, you know, he nearly beat Wal van Aert in the, the Olympics. But for even a pole, it has to be solo. Whereas all these other guys in the group that you mentioned, except for Sivakov is the exception, but Hulgard, Benoit Kozneffwa, he will back his sprint. They will all back their sprint and they really – they wouldn't mind dropping Colbrelli, thinning out the group a bit more to even, you know, improve your odds. But I, I thought – I, I didn't understand, Benji, why Hermans was pulling so much Be- between the climbs. I thought what you want to do for Belgium is make the climbs as hard as possible. I don't think yeah, Colzinefra or Colbrelli sitting in the group on the flat while you're pulling is really putting him under pressure particularly. I felt like use Hermans as a puncher like Patrice Stevenines on the climb, smash it. If you don't get separation, stop and then repeat the next climb because we've still got a couple of climbs to go or maybe even three. So rather than what I saw was them pulling and then I'm like, well, Herman's going to blow up and then Avonhall's going to have to attack and if he doesn't, you know, if no one's set pace, it might not be able to get separation. And then you've got VC behind. Am I overrating the fact that maybe VC and the Wolf were cooked at that point and they wouldn't have been able to help anyway? I don't think Campanarts was... Th- completely cooked because the reason that he got in that second group was because of that mechanical that he had and he had to get two bike changes for that which means that he likely still had the energy he was looking really strong this entire race up to that point so it wouldn't surprise me if he had something left because we know that Campanarts can hold on quite long in a race like this after seeing the look store this year and in all honesty I think that as you say Hedmonds probably should not have pulled that much in the uh in the sections between the climbs, because if you look at the group behind that was forming a five man group, uh, we eventually had like, I think it was Almeida together with oh, um, a Belgian. Was it Campanars in the second group? Yeah, Campanars and, and Molima. The Wolf following <laughs> with Molima, indeed. And we saw a move by, by Almeida on the left side, and Molima suddenly was like, I'm not going to pace that back. While he's got no Dutch riders ever, he needs to pace it back. What do you think? Belgium's going to do it for you. And actually, Belgium was going to do it for him. And Kampenarts comes to the front, starts pacing and asks for Molema to take over. And Molema's like, no, I'm not chasing back Almeida now. I don't know why he didn't do that. This doesn't make sense at all because at that point, he's basically ruining his own race from that point onwards. But uh, I think that it could have been beneficial for Belgium, even with bringing back Almeida and Molema to also get the Wolf and Kampenarts back to the front. But yeah. They didn't, and uh, I'm not sure that it would have been a huge influence, but I think it's something that I would have at least considered personally. So we've got Trenton pacing in this group, group one forming. We've got the group behind chasing pretty much gives up. We're coming to the second last of the climbs, and we're thinking, well, Trenton and Colbrelli, they just want this all together. He's the fastest man here, but still against a group of 10, it's not, you know, that's not great odds. It could be better odds. Cosnefra has been has looked the strongest punching wise on the climbs following Remco before, and they get to the second last climb. Hermans, who's been pacing a lot of the flat and some of the rolling sections, gets onto the climb, paces for a long time on the second last climb, only twenty k's to go or so, and then Sivakov is the man to attack. It almost seemed like Remco was hemmed in a bit by the spectators on the right hand side. Kozinefra was in his wheel the whole time. Sivakov attacks. He's marked by Pagacha or Colbrelli, I believe, and then Remco counters. And a really strong counter bringing with him Kozinefra and Sonny Colbrelli. So Colbrelli continuing his unreal form into this race. And they drop Pagacha on this sort of the incline lessens a little bit. They drop him there and they're gone. They immediately get up to 20, 25 seconds. That's even with the three UAE teammates. Actually, no, Trenton's not pulling because he's Cobrelli's teammate. He or she and Pagacha, the two UAE teammates, are pulling. But the the rest of the group aren't really like Hulgard. is probably on his limit, to be honest. So he's not working too hard. Sivakov's just attacked and then he got dropped and he's descending. You know, On the descent, he's pretty inefficient as well. So we have this group of three and it's Remco pulling the entire time, which is... Still somewhat surprising to me even here because 
Cole Brelly didn't might probably wouldn't pull. I don't know. Would you pull if you were Cole Brelly there? Would you back yourself in a group of ten Benji against Hulgard Pagacha, or would you offer turns here and there against even Apollo? Would you be too worried about the climb coming up to last Povo? Well, with Trenton there, he shouldn't have pulled at all. With Colbrelli just, I don't think Colbrelli should pace in general. Because, like, people know that he's the best sprinter. On paper, it's the other way around that. They usually do it on the flat sections. Usually when a sprinter's in the group, the others won't pace and let the sprinter do the work. But on the climb itself, uh, I'd be like, I'm Colbrelli. I'll just follow. Like, I don't know how strong I'll be on the next climb if I can hold on. I had some trouble when Cosner Fry and Evenepoel went. So... I would just save my energy as much as possible and they can all like, I don't care, like, it's not my problem. I'm riding for Italy and not for Belgium, so I should not be pacing at this point. And uh, if they've got Hermann's pacing and they have Hermann's in this group, then they've got two riders and I'm going to use that to my advantage. I'm going to tell them, okay, you've got two riders, so Hermann's can do all the work here, I won't. An important distinction to make here, which you might not notice, is that if you go and look back at the tape, Remco's on the front pulling really hard in these flat sections. He offers no draft, just about. Kosnefra is second wheel for a lot of the fast section into the base of the last climb. I think he should have pulled, pushed Colbrelli through. He eventually did a bit later, but Colbrelli was getting a much better draft than Kosnefra. And we get onto the base of that last climb. We're like, Remco has to attack here. Kozinefra drops almost straight away as Remco is pacing. And Remco, I think he has to, the way he rides is he's not like Alaphilippe where he's going to just snap off, you know, 750 watts for 30 seconds, 800 watts for 30 seconds on the climb on a steep section and gap called really. He has to see, try and do a, as hard a tempo for a long time on the steep sections as possible. Can't drop Cole Brelli. Cole Brelli looking under a bit of pressure but is so far into the climb. Can't drop him and they get to the crest. The gap is like... 30 seconds to, to close in front, maybe more. A minute to the group behind. We see the Belgian car go up alongside Remco Benji. What do you think they were saying? Well, what they on paper should say to Remco is, don't do anything, just sit in his wheel because you've got a situation, you've crossed the top of the last climb, unable to drop Sonny Colbrelli. If that happens, you know you're likely fucked for this race, but the only chance where you can do something is if you don't end up pacing the majority of the parts from this point onwards to the finish line, and you don't have the first spot the entire time, because you can't attack that easily from the first position in a group of two. You need to be in the wheel, and you need to try and do it at a surprise moment after a corner or into a corner or stuff like that. And the problem is, the car went by him. I don't know what they said, but based on what happened afterwards, it seems like they either didn't communicate that he shouldn't be doing nothing from this point onwards. Or perhaps they told him, mate, you're fucked. Right for silver. Then we've got a medal. Because if you completely stop and the other group comes past, you're going to get out sprinted for second easily. I think you should wait every time uh, and not pedal. Because the way... It's a medal raise, though. I mean, do you think Remco is running for a medal? The way he looked at the end? Belgium is. Remco is not running for a medal. I agree, personally. like. But it's something we need to keep in mind. I mean, maybe that explains why I find us sort of at uh, the big <laughs> international races and we might see at the World Championships. Maybe we'll see, yeah, Remco pulling Asgren in a group at World Champs because, you know, medals, uh, yeah, silver medals, <laughs> great. Um, but I would have stayed up because what you want for Remco and how he's often so six is so much harder, I think, to get a gap for a guy like him out of a corner on one guy, as Benji said, who's sitting right behind you, also who's stronger, who can just you know, throw in 800 watts for five seconds in the saddle, get straight back to your wheel. Let Cosner Fry come back. Colbrelli might not want that. And then you have another situation, or maybe let the group come back. And then what you want for Remco is you would do one of your little attacks out of the corner where it's in the saddle. You can't really see a perceptible change in his body. It gets five meters. And then you want two guys to look at each other. And then he's gone. That seems he has a lot of success attacking in that fashion. And sorry, but this isn't Amy to Hent. You're not just going to ride him off your wheel at Druven Curtis um, when the rest of the group just have gone the other way. This is called Brelli. Like, you can't just, you're not going to ride him off his wheel. So, Dan Lloyd on comms was, um, yeah, was roasting the tactics, which I think was pretty spot on, to be honest, because he just basically let out Cole Brelli for 10Ks. Yeah. Not, there's nothing more to say. He let out Cole Brelli for 10Ks, didn't attack him. Maybe he couldn't have done anything anyway, but it went from a 5 7% chance of attacking him out of a corner. 
to 0%. Because yep. in this sprint, he Colbrelli dive-bombed him on the inside, got in front of him, and then was just looking at Remco. Because Remco, Colbrelli knows his sprint is so superior that he just is like, okay, when are you going to kick Remco? Sees Remco sprinting, doesn't get up to Colbrelli's back wheel. Colbrelli opens up, wins by seven bike lengths with a, a long post-up. So... Yeah, I mean, a great result for Cole Brilly. His level is insane right now. Yes, the climb wasn't that steep for to give Remco something, uh, and Remco comes second. But yeah, how do you think Cole Brilly, Benji, moves into the conversation for world championships alongside the likes of Asger and Pedersen, Wild Van Aert? Do you have him in, in that tier now with this kind of form? Because I do. Yeah, after Benelux, I was already seeing him as uh, one of the big guns there. And Italy in general has a strong team in this kind of races. And also in the likes of World Championships race, we've got Ghana today, who is acting on the initial sections. But on the World Champs parkour, I would expect Ghana to be able to hold on longer and be more of a factor in the latter part of the race instead of in the first, like, 50 kilometers here. So stuff like that is what could change the World Championships compared to this. But if this race is anything to show for the World Championships, then the World Champs are going to be mad stuff. But... I'm just scared that the initial portion of the Belgian uh, World Champs parkour is definitely not as hard as the European Champs one and not as decisive in creating action from the start. So that's why I'm uh, slightly scared for that parkour to deliver the same great result out of the entertainment as this race. But like you said, Colbrelli, a great win. Um, it sucks that he wins because, let's be real, the Italian jersey is not going to be seen until June next year in the peloton. And I hate that because it's one of the best flags in the bloody peloton would you see it last year as well anyway? needs a law <laughs> bahrain probably stuff it up anyway <laughs> <laughs> well he's worn it for quite a bit now <laughs> true yeah nizzolo's is a great jersey and they were validated italy for leaving nizzolo the reigning european championship uh, champion out of this race but should do the top 10 and here's the gaps which is why we like why is remco pacing colbrelli first remco second colsner third at a minute 30 and it was a big gap yep. when the car came next to Remco. So I'd love to know what they said. Yeah, I, I think hope... 40 seconds at that point. Then it okay. went up to like 138 in, in the descent alone. So going into the final kilometers, like the final five to seven kilometers, Remco should not have been at the front of that group. And that's pretty clear. But uh, I think perhaps he was like, I think he was just very frustrated and couldn't make his mind about the tactic there because I think, it's it's a it's a mistake and he probably realizes it right now but in the end i do think that if you arrive at the top of that last climb with uh with cobrelli in a two-man group and you haven't dropped him on the climb then you're pretty much fucked so you've got like uh i wouldn't even say seven percent like you said or i would have said like three percent from that point onwards i had uh, like all thoughts on cobrelli winning but the saddest part about all this is that i had two riders that i had a bet on today and for the first time i'm betting on cycling in months and that was Cosner for an Evan Pool. Mate, I want to Evan Pool was such short odds for this. But anyway, Cosner for third at a minute 30. Trenton wins the group sprint behind at a minute 43. Pagacha fifth. Then he or she, Hulgaard, a nice result for Norway seventh. Then Hermans, who I'd love to see where he goes next year if he stays at ISN. Then Sivakov, Kampanas, rounding out the top 10. Benji's on media watch in the Belgian press to see what was said from the car. I'm sure we'll find out later and Benji will tweet about it. Uh, but otherwise, other stories of this race, I guess, is the big world chance favourites not being here. Uh, in Wild Van Aert, who, uh, if you haven't watched the Tour of Britain, here's the result. But he just won almost at the same time the Belgian um, favourite for the world championship. So interesting to see how the Avonapol, Wild Van Aert dynamic will play out at the world champs. Otherwise, any other talking points from this, Benji? I guess Sivakov continues to look good. And Kampenarts, I think. Let's talk a little bit about Victor Kampenarts, who's rebranded himself completely. <laughs> to It's almost inconceivable to think 18 months ago that this is the sort of rider and level he could be, be at, being in you know a frontline important domestique now for the World Championships for Belgium on that sort of course. Yes, certainly. I think it started off all on that breakaway stage during the Giro last year, where he basically realized that he could do stuff next to Tom Troll properly. And he's, he brought himself to that second spot. And the next year, he, he went for it. He decided to train more for the couple sections. We saw that the results in Tom Trolls that were significantly worse than last year. 
And he was very active during races, like in Le Samin at the start of the year. He was attacking basically every corner, Kuhnberg and Kuhn as well. The problem is if you attack the whole time, it's not very useful because by the time a decisive attack comes, you don't have the energy anymore. And it seems like he had to learn that across the entire season so far. And more and more, he seems to be spending his energy more wisely through races. Today, he was more in a domestique role. I think if you don't put Dumpenart's in a domestique role today, he's in a last 10-man group. And he was technically even in a, in a domestique group <laughs> role. So crazy ride by... Uh, by Campanades, and I can't wait to see more of him. I said it earlier. Roubaix, I hope he rides it. I think he does according to uh, what I've seen so far. So uh, I'm curious yeah, what he can do it. on a parkour like that. It's on his uh, upcoming participations on Pro Cycling Stats. He's got Grand Prix de Wallonie. He should do well there. He's come sec- Even six years ago, he came second at Tour de Wallonie. Do you reckon Benji... Going back, if he went back to 2015, Victor Campanats, he would have made this change sooner because the potential's there. When I look at his Palmares, like he's came second on GC at Balboa's of Belgium Tour in 2019, where Remco was, beat him in a stage there as well. Although I think that's where Remco like pulled the entire time again, and then lost in the sprint, but still won GC, I believe. Do you think if you could go back in time and thinking money wise, he would have made more money if he committed to being a classics guy, particularly as a Belgian? Um, I think he might have, personally. I think he might have had, even if you're getting fifth and sixth in some of these big races, you're going to get paid pretty well and you're not going to be on one-year deals anymore Um, because, yeah, he's had a bit of – he's had to chop and change teams a fair bit. So do you think he would have changed or do you think the TT thing was just an itch he had to scratch and he got unlucky with the likes of Ghana turning up? I vaguely remember – an interview some at some point in uh in his career where he was talking about why he chose time trial as the thing he wanted to do and it was because he wanted to be the best at one thing and wanted to be better than everyone else at one thing and that's why he did time trial because he would he was pretty good at it and he was like that's closer to me potentially being better than other people at that point and he was very close to being one of the best time trialists in the world like arguably in the top 7 at certain years in in the last five years and perhaps he realized after his one uh, one hour record uh holder thingy and then not being able to succeed at becoming the best time troll is because you had the dennis you had ganna coming around now and once ganna came around it seems like perhaps that was a switch like i'm fucked if i keep on doing this i'm never gonna be the best if ganna's around and i think that's partially the reason those young talents taking over in that aspect and being more prominent there and potentially being a, an obstacle in the road of becoming the best time trollist in the world. And perhaps that was why he was like, okay, I should look for different places to to win stuff now. And I think he probably does not regret that change at all. No, definitely. And now it can extend his career much, much longer because now it's like, what does the next four years, five years hold for Campanats if he keeps improving as this guy and making the transition he has? Yeah. Speaking of time trials, we just round out the results of the European Champs men's ITT, 22.5K is long, and we had a lot of good riders here we've just mentioned, and it's why it's so hard to win World Tour-level time trials when you're coming against Cavagna, Kung, Dennis, Juan Fanart, Pagacha, Roglic, uh, Dumoulin, who won another one? I'm missing someone. I'm probably, uh, I always, we always forget Cavanaugh, so I made sure I did him first. <laughs> but that was won by Stefan Kung, who's been the, uh, always the, the groom, the, what is it, the, the groomsman, never the groom? What's the expression? Yeah. Bridesmaid. Always the bridesmaid, never the bride. Thanks but to he's, the producer. <laughs> he's turning that around <laughs> this year. He beats Ghana. By eight seconds in a 55k an hour, 25 minute TT, 15 seconds into Avonapol, then Bissiger fourth, Valscheid, a nice result actually uh, in fifth. I'm not sure. Maybe Valscheid's, can someone check? Was Valscheid able to use different equipment, non trade team equipment here for Germany? Uh, Affini sixth, Asgren seventh, Bodnar eighth, a nice result, Cavagnar ninth, and Almeida tenth, Pagacha in twelfth. So as I said, Pagacha TTing is not always. Uh, phenomenal. Sometimes it's, I bet he's probably been on holiday and he's just coming back yeah. now. But Kung Benji and beating Ghana, it's got to be his best TT performance ever if for him. Yep, certainly. And the thing about Kung is like the 20 kilometer time trials have always been the best 
kind of time trials for him. Every single time, those were the ones where he was performing really well. I think he was European champs last year as well, although the competition there was just lower. And he did get third last year as well at the World Championship. So he's always very close, but he needed that one where he could just be better than everybody else. And it seemed like that was the case here. And it was odd because this was a really close fight. At the intermediate, I swear that Gana was like first time at intermediate, two seconds or or so ahead of uh, Evenepoel. And then Kung was a bit further behind. I think it was four to five to six seconds or something uh, on Gana. So King had to come from behind and had to be the better man on the second section, do a bit of a negative split, but perhaps accidentally that he didn't go fast enough at the start. And it was like, okay, now I need to go a bit faster in the second section to try and catch up. And I looked at the last kilometer and we saw Ghana flying through every corner. And I was saying at that point, Ghana wins. Like, even if Poole's not going to fly through the corners exactly in the same way that Ghana just did. And then King did exactly the same, but even faster. And I couldn't wrap my head around it. He came through that corner and was like, what, 16 seconds for the last section? I was like, this this has to be wrong. How? <laughs> and, and in the end, he ends up winning. I'm so happy that he's got that and that he that he doesn't have that disappointed face he had the last few times. He was just second on a few seconds, which was heartbreaking. Was it the Pagacha hot seat where he looked so disappointed? Stage five of the Tour de France. Oh. Yeah. He was so sad. Anyway, he's on a long-term deal at FDJ into 2023. They seem to have improved their equipment um, from what I can see. Maybe they revamped the uh, their bikes as well. He's 27 in the prime of his life. I really, really want to see how he goes at Paris Bay because he is in, in good shape, Stefan Kung. And I, it suits him more Paris Bay, uh, one would think, than it's even Benelux to, to yeah. be honest. Uh, so I can't I, wait um... to see him there. I want to talk one second about Walsh and have a question for you. We know that there's rules like above one meter ninety, you can use custom stuff or something or longer extensions. It was, but he's one meter ninety nine. Is it a big deficit <laughs> to Walsh that there's no rule for like even longer extensions above one ninety five or something? I don't know what the extensions rules are. They just seem so arbitrary. Like Sivakov's one eighty eight and. He's always going to have a worse TT because the rule starts at 190. I, obviously, Volscheid should be allowed extra, extra long. <laughs> I, I don't know. I saw a photo of a UCI race on Twitter where maybe the French UCI race where they, the guys just hang the bike up. You know how they normally have a jig to measure its all yeah. supplies? It was just like a cardboard cutout of a jig behind. <laughs> yes. He just sort of poked it. It's like, net, you know, when you go into a store and you're like, oh, these, these trousers will fit. And you just like, put, like, just hold them over <laughs> yourself and it, it fucking never yeah, fit. Yeah. And the funniest <laughs> part about that one was it, it wasn't even carbon. I think it was like a paper or like plastic thing. It was flapping thing in and the wind. The wind was flapping it around and it was in no it way correct flat. or even noticeable if the bike was the correct size. It was. Uh, just a gigantic <laughs> joke, but hey, I guess that's uh, part of our sport and that's what makes it fun for us to talk about, I guess. I mean, what would happen if, if Wout van Aert was 188 or Remco had to wear his socks legally? I mean, Belgian TTing would be in absolute tatters. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Don't say that. <laughs> I haven't even looked at the TT for the World Champs course. I've, in case people haven't noticed, by the way, it's I've flat. Been, is it flat or right? Makes Completely sense. flat. I've had a bit of it's a holiday in my last week. Um, going to Barcelona tomorrow. Going to maybe French Basque Country after that. And uh, I've been bring my. I've got to bring my equipment with me, Benji, just in case the Miguel and El Lopez news, which we saw the rumor. A um, bit of a tangent here, but we saw the rumor in El Pace that oh, the contract's done. They're just working out with the lawyers. Like when is it going to be announced officially? Have I missed something? When I've been elf hanging in the in the mountains. As in the news of Lopez being ditched by Movistar? Yeah. Or? Is it, it's not confirmed yet, right? It's not completely confirmed yet, and uh, I guess it's a matter of time because it sounds like the rumors are pretty pretty official <laughs> at this point. But uh, I guess we'll we'll cover it when it happens. I want no, I want to get your. I'm not letting you off so easy. I want to get your preliminary <laughs> take on this. If you're Lopez and you actually wanted to stay at Movistar, I think it would have been possible, except. The all the leaks from his camp, his father-in-law and his wife, on giving actual interviews about it. I think, I think that was tough and not a strategic. If he did want to stay, not a, a good move strategically. I wouldn't want to say, if I'm Lopez, you wouldn't want to. No, because if the team considers throwing you out for that reason, I wouldn't want to stay with the team. I agree with you. 
I, they I can agree. fuck off. To be honest, and also it was confirmed. Uh, rival cycling podcast, the cycling podcast, which <clears throat> I, I was listening to, they there was an interview and Freeb translated it uh, for from uh, Unzue, and Unzue confirmed he told them uh, this hasn't been conf- like on Twitter widely um, sort of talked about. Unzue confirmed he told Lopez to stop. That is confirmed, but the difference is he told him to stop to wait for Rojas now, which is semi defensible. But when that happened, exactly, we don't know. If you tell them to wait for Rojas when the gap's at 20 seconds, it's like, are you kidding? But if you tell them to wait when it's at three minutes, I think that's actually not a bad thing to say. Uh, I Like, the gap was so significant at that point for the, for the waiting for Rojas part. Like, Rojas was not 10 seconds behind, so... <laughs> he, he, was back in, he was back in a different province at that point. <laughs> <laughs> like it, the the entire story of that stage just doesn't make sense to well, and I, I at this point I, I I also blame the management management of this team completely, and like <laughs> I don't know, like in in total, my opinion about him being com- like exited from the team is just it's just dumb from Movistar's point because Lopez is the most winning rider on their team, Easy. and they are currently three or four positions from being thrown out of the world tour after next season because they're so close to it in points. He's the one that let out. So before he won on Gamonetera, he, he let out Valverde for the Dauphiné stage win. So exactly. like that was their he, biggest win. He's the only re- person in the three man leadership that wants to work for other people when it's necessary. Yeah, I've got a big video coming if he does the contract does get terminated, I'll be compiling it, drafting in the background, detailing going through the Vuelta. Mas did not help Lopez ever. He did in the Dauphiné. He did leave him out in the Dauphiné. Have, though. I think I think it's a he, no. He I shouldn't mean, have, but uh, why couldn't he help him when they were pacing on uh, when Roglic attacked and cooked himself? Yeah, true. Why not? Why why is that all on Lopez? Why not then? Why not that? But yeah, that's enough on that drama. Um, we'll be producing content about that when and if it does happen. Because yeah, I think if Mars had had thrown that sort of action, I don't think he'd be getting his contract terminated. Yeah, certainly not. He's that's Spanish. Not, that's not, <laughs> Benji said it, but yeah, I think it, it as well. It, it, it's true. But in the end, I also want to, next to that Lopez story, uh, point you to our Twitter. I put a tweet up uh, one or two or three days ago for a... Uh, an upcoming second Q and A in the coming months and a half, perhaps somewhere whenever we see it fit during uh, or after the races, and uh, we'll be taking questions from there. I can't promise we will answer every single one, but we will give it a try. Okay. Is that once we hit twenty thousand subscribers on YouTube? Yes, only if we hit twenty thousand subscribers <laughs> yeah. on YouTube. All right, that makes sense. Okay, <laughs> thanks to our show partner Lakov for supporting the podcast. We hope you enjoyed this little tangent at the end in what was a very enjoyable European Championships, and we'll see you sometime when there's the next world tour race uh is one frankfurt okay whenever that is all right we might have something in the interim just to keep yourselves going ciao